Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. My co-host today is, I, I'm so grateful, uh, I, uh, we've done a cluster of recordings lately where I've really got to talk to really great film brains, some of my favorite film writers and thinkers on the internet, and this person is absolutely included in that conversation. You can find their writing around in the internet on publications like W Magazine, GQ, New York Times, just a few little upstart publications such as those. But the thing that brings us together today, uh, in addition to just discussing cinema, is discussing this author, Kyle Turner's new upcoming book, The Queer Film Guide, 100 Great Movies That Tell LGBTQIA Plus Stories. That is the peg. And Kyle Turner, what else do the folks need to know about you before we get going? Well, th- first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to yes. be here. Really excited to talk to you. Um, the other things that um, the the folks should should know about me is um, my go to karaoke song is "Valerie" by Mark Ronson featuring Amy Winehouse. Ooh, okay. Um, and if I were on death row, my final meal would be um, chicken noodle soup, um, General Tso chicken, and a chocolate lava cake. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I like that. We. Mm-hmm. I. I. This is a really good foundation. I think to dive into the movie that you have brought, which is Down with Love. Mm-hmm. Who of the, which character within Down with Love have you brought for us to discuss today? I've brought with us. It's. It's almost one and a half characters, if I'm being totally honest. <laughs> um, it's. It's Peter McManus, played by David Hyde Pierce. Mm-hmm. Who is, in essence, like, he is both his own character in that he is the executive or editor-in-chief of No Magazine, the magazine for men in the know. Um, mm-hmm. And his, he is the boss of star writer uh, Catcher Block, played by Ewan McGregor. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, it, it, No Magazine is basically like a GQ or an Esquire um, in, mm. in, in this, like, 60s fantasy world um, in this film. Um, but he is also, it's hard to take away from the sort of, like, meta text of the fact that um, David Hyde Pierce is also was also very well known for playing um, Niles Crane on Frasier. Absolutely. And it's hard, I, 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 like, th- there's obviously a lot of DNA from from um, Niles that is in Peter McManus's um, mm-hmm. character, but I think what's also very lovely is, um, I think Peter is, uh, is, by having this background as an editor, a w- much more self-aware about the things that he's doing as opposed to Niles, mm-hmm. uh, and much more self-aware about the way that in, in which he approaches sex and sexuality and romance than Niles ever was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But he still maintains like a similar kind of neurosis, which I yeah. very much identify with. It really, like, watching, this is a 2003 movie. This is an interesting, such an interesting time for its stars because you have, you have David Hyde Pierce is very much Niles at this time in 2003. This is two years after Moulin Rouge. So Mm -hmm. this is like a peak hunkiness era of Ewan McGregor. I am blanking right now on when Bridget Jones's Diary came out in the context of this. But we are in, like, this is a pretty solid one. Okay, yeah, this is a pretty solid Renee Zellweger uh-huh. high point era as well. We're coming a couple years off of Bring It On, which mm-hmm. is also from director Peyton Reed. This is, mm-hmm. oh, I'm getting confirmation from producer Marissa, 2001 Bridget Jones Diary. This is mm-hmm. really a collision of stars. Mm-hmm. I feel like in a surprising way, like looking back on it, I feel like when you look at the poster now, I feel like that might not be the front of one's mind that this is a night of stars. But then mm-hmm. you think of it in its time capsule context. This is a pretty like eclectic big deal headline cast with the like side universe Sarah Paulson supporting character where mm-hmm. it's like the alternate universe version of Sarah Paulson's career where she doesn't do American Horror Story and she's just playing like kind of kooky side characters like uh-huh. this and New Year's Eve for the rest mm-hmm. of her career. Mm-hmm. She was in New Year's Eve. She is in the smallest plot of the New Year's Eve, like, compilation of storylines film. She is one of the pregnant women trying to have a baby. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, okay, like, yeah, either yeah. right on or the first baby yeah. of the New Year so that they can win, like, $50,000 from the hospital. That's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Just makes me think of the state of the American healthcare system. Um, <laughs> Truly. Um, but also, Renee Zellweger is coming off of a Golden Globe win for Chicago right. and an mm-hmm. Oscar nomination for that as well. And You're then you also right. have Rachel, Rachel Dratch, who appears as like a supporting character. And she's like very, uh, this is like, I think around her SNL 
tenure. And then you have like yes. all these other actors who are from the era in which like um, the movie is uh, paying homage to slash parodying, like mm-hmm. um, Tony Randall. Um, I think uh, Michael, uh, Matt Ross and Michael Ensign are also like of that whole universe as well. Chris Parnell, mm-hmm. also SNL um, uh, alumni. That's right. This yeah. does like almost like the way that well, I haven't watched this in a long time and I kind of felt like I felt like neither here nor there about it on my last watch. But I was having a blast with it mm-hmm. this time around. I was like, God, what a movie that deserves to be like playing in fun little repertory screenings. Uh-huh. It is uh-huh. so completely committed. This is Down With Love is the story of we enter the frame. It's New York City in 1962. We hear there are 8 million people in the city, but make that 8 million, 8 million and, and, one. and one. The place... New York City. The time, now, 1962. And there's no time or place like it. If you've got a dream, this is the place to make that dream come true. That's why the soaring population of hopeful dreamers has just reached 8 million people. Oh, make that 8 million and one. Barbara Novak, new author, has just arrived in the city to promote her new nonfiction book, Down With Love, about how women should basically withhold love and instead engage in just, like, a la carte sex, as she says, uh, in order to reclaim their autonomy, become truly equal in society and the workplace. And her editor is Sarah Paulson, and her book is about to revolutionize the world in, like, the gender equality movement. But one man refuses to believe that she is impenetrable to love, and that is the, what is it, man's man, man ladies' man, man about town, catcher block? Yes, yes. Yes, he is like exactly. the the head writer, star writer of, as Kyle said, the like GQ equivalent No magazine. And God, when I was watching this, he endeavors. I, I won't start talking myself, but he endeavors to con Barbara into falling in love with him. He's going to play a totally separate person. He's going to completely lie to her. He's going to con her because he wants to prove that no woman is immune to love. And so, of course, the hijinks ensue. But this movie is end-to-end art directed to be a fantasy version of 1962. And immediately I was like, I want to hear Kyle talk about just like the fantasy world of when the you could live a glamorous high life as a magazine writer and editor oh, and if he God. thought about that while he was watching this movie <laughs> that's so that's such a mean question oh, and this God. current landscape of of media and and uh, of of the media industry and of journalism in general i mean you I, I, you i imagine have even more of an intimate like frustration <laughs> than myself <laughs> not to bring up any not to uh, reopen any old wounds, but no. Like, but it's just like this is like it, I feel <sighs> like I wonder if that's the case. If that happens for everyone who is either a current or once and former journalist who like sees something like this, and if they feel that kind of heartbreak that like I absolutely yeah. like that like starry eyed kind of heartbreak when we walk in and we see. Um, we see their gorgeous offices. We see the apartment that Barbara's editor has got for her. And she's like, it's adorable. And it's a fucking beautiful penthouse with a you know high-rise view in the city. And I was like, oh, my God. I was reflecting Fl- on this recently. Like, God, remember when one of the coolest fucking things you could be in the entire world was a magazine writer or uh-huh. editor? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That was like and movie star status. Remember when you could have expense accounts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Times yeah, like, man. I, it's sort of like fascinating to watch the media industry crumble. Fascinating, and by fascinating, I mean deeply heartbreaking and frustrating. Um, but but also, that. like, there's still in in certain um, pockets of major metro areas. Mm-hmm. I think, especially New York or LA, um, there there's still like an attitude around the people who work for magazines. They just are not yes. being paid for the like prestige that's associated with that job. I have. Enough friends who are working at, like, uh-huh. you know, glossies and whatnot, who do have, like, a certain cultural cachet, but um, if they aren't coming from money or didn't go to an Ivy League or whatever, they're, like, slowly dying inside. And they're, you can you can see the sort of cracks in the facade, especially when you get go drinking mm-hmm. with them or something. And it's just, it's such a 
different world, also in terms of like the influence that their work can have. Because um, mm-hmm. like what launches down, what launches Barbara Novak's book is um, besides like the television appearance that she's able to get on the Ed Sullivan show of her book by having Judy Garland sing yeah. Down with Love. One of my favorite songs of all time. Um, the way they work in the archival footage performance of Judy singing Down With Love, is, it's absolutely impressive. Ex- like, this movie Incredible. executed. Oh, so good. She wasn't even on the bill. How did they fit her into the lineup? Oh, the best luck. The singing nun fell off her scooter coming across the Tiboro oh. Bridge. I guess now, somebody up there likes me. for you a really big surprise because to coincide with the arrival of the new book, Down with love, we have a very, very special friend of our show to do a song of that book. Now, I want a really big, warm welcome for Judy Garland. Right up. Down with love, the flowers and rice and the shoes. Down with love. Um, but it's also the fact that, like, um, no, no magazine. It has such a um role in that like cultural um and social landscape mm-hmm. that they would need to cover her. That it's mm-hmm. that her book poses like um an ideological or or political threat. And what's mm-hmm. fascinating about this movie to me, um, I've I've been a big fan of it ever since I had it on VHS back in two thousand three. <laughs> Um, when they had the little music video of them singing Here's to Love at the very end, and I know all the lyrics to that as well. Um, <laughs> what's fascinating is that as I've gotten older watching it and as my like own um, politics um, and understanding of uh, how gender and sexuality and um, the way those things are contextualized by uh, social, cultural, and political context mm-hmm. um, change, it's become more and more apparent that down with love is both like somewhat prophetic and also a eulogy in as much as like the um the way in mm. which um corporate uh feminism is ultimately our biggest downfall because it doesn't make anyone happy it just makes people rich but it doesn't make anyone happy you're, they are. They're they're girl bossing too close to the sun. Yes. Like yes. there is a threshold at which the white feminists girl boss too hard and they confess to one another, I'm not a down with love girl. Mm-hmm. Like they were posturing too performatively to maintain sustainable change and are now like, oh my God, I staked my entire sense of self on a catchphrase and I'm nothing. Mm-hmm. For as man crazy as I've been my whole life, I sure can't stand him. I think I'll just get married. You're just upset. You'll find another job. I don't want another job. I'm sorry, Barbara, but I don't want to be a down with love girl anymore. I give up. I give in. I just want to be Mrs. Peter McManus. Really? At least then there'd be one man I could tell what to do. Anyway, there, I've said it. And if you also want me to resign as your friend, I understand. Oh, Vicky. No! How could I possibly accept your resignation now when I need a friend more than ever? You see, I have a confession to make, too. I'm not a down-with-love girl, either. I'm a woman who's fallen in love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and what's, and, like, the, I guess, was uh, spoiling endings here. Like, yeah. it's, it goes so far as to have her have Barbara Novak um, girl bossing into a line of chocolate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Part of her new media empire that her and publisher Vicky have launched together. They they have like an international like banner that they've hung up. And within the publishing banner, there is Now magazine for mm-hmm. women in the now. And mm-hmm. they have also launched a line of chocolate because as Sarah Paulson points out, if people are, if chocolate sales are spiking, there's no reason they shouldn't get a piece of that. And it's like, and there is the, there is the capitalismization of feminist awakening. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. It's here. Down with love. Chocolate. <gasps> a mouthful of satisfaction in every bite. Vicky, you are a genius. Look, your book got chocolate sales to soar. Why shouldn't we get a piece of the action? They sure kill my craving for sex. <laughs> the only man who can have his way with me now is Milton Hershey. <laughs> I was not as, like, sentient um, in 2003. So you saw this when it first came out. You, did you see this when it first came out in 2003? 
I I saw it when it first came out on VHS in 2003. Okay, I was 18 at the time. I how uh-huh. old were how old roundabouts were you? Um, I would have been 10. <laughs> What an incredible time to have Down With Love imprint on you. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I mean, I think I was definitely going for um, Renee Zellweger because I liked Chicago a lot. And um, yes. Ewan McGregor because I liked Star Wars a lot. Mm-hmm. And it was also, like, it, it, the connection between Down With Love and um, Screwball Comedy is, is, is slightly more tenuous. I, it, mm. it does follow, it does have like a, a similar um, sort of template or framework, um, yeah. but it's like obviously much more in conversation with the um, quasi sex comedies of Doris Day and Mark Hudson. Um, but mm. like the appeal of that kind of romantic comedy where there's like a lot of contrivance and a lot of hijinks. Um, yes. And it's predicated on, uh, on the two stars, like sexual persona. I, like, um, I, I, think what we may have lost in contemporary romantic comedies is the fact that like sex does define a lot of the romantic comedy leads of the past yeah. because that is like the sort of cultural um capital that they're able to use in order to outsmart one another mm-hmm. um and because like uh because of the Hayes Code sex then had to be like had to be inferred or implied rather yeah. um through language or through set design or through um as they play with um the pillow talk split screen thing of all those innuendos mm-hmm. um so yeah I, I there were a bunch of reasons why i think down with love appealed to me and also i was like a deeply hopeless romantic child as a um as a, as a young person i was like <laughs> always i was listening to cole porter songs and like serenading like random oh, classmates wow. because i thought it was um something that they would want Turns out that is not the case. <laughs> they do not want me singing Easy to Love from Anything Goes to Them, which is ad- admittedly somewhat of a homosexual thing to do, even if you are pining <laughs> after a young woman. I, well, so then I, what you say about like sex being the lever of power that people have in these movies with with McManus, with Peter McManus specifically, that is the number one thing he does not have to use as a lever against because he is so bound up by his, as he tells Catcher at one point, he's like, you're the best friend a guy with 20 diagnosed neuroses could have. Mm-hmm. Catch, you are the best friend a guy with 20 diagnosed neuroses ever had. Well, we've been friends a long time. I knew you when you only had 12. Oh, this is great. Oh, I'll be right back. I gotta go put in my shoe lifts. So were you at 10 immediately clicking with Peter McManus and was there a bit of resonance there? <laughs> At the time, I think I only had 10 diagnosed neuroses, but I was on my way, you know, halfway there, halfway to go. Um, I think I was attracted to the idea of someone who was trying so hard to fit into this, like, certain um, masculinist ideal, but just, like, can't do it. Like, um, through no fault of their own, it is just unnatural to them. I think there's something very queer about that, trying to perform a certain role of masculinity when you have ostensibly have like the various resources available to you and you Uh have like the guide but you have like uh peter has literally a role model on which he can base his performance and he's still bad at it and (laughs) i i identify i've always identified with that and there then there's a level to which peter like as much as he cares can't help it. And then he just sort of, like, does what he does in his own way when he's, like, searching for um, the really cool bar that's in technically Catcher's apartment and he's trying (laughs) to play it off cool and just like, stop trying. Just (laughs) relax. Relax. If you relaxed a little bit, you'd be fine. And that's also that line... um, it, it's it's clear that he's extremely sincere about how much he wants um, some sort of, like... um, combination of intimacy and also mm-hmm. uh um professional support because yeah. he, um the the courtship that he has with um Vicky also played by a queer person mm-hmm. um which makes like a very a, a fun yes! sort of like romantic <laughs> dynamic as well um but he she's talking about how um the men who uh resent her won't see her mm-hmm. and the men who respect her won't like sleep with her yeah um and peter's response is well i would resent you and respect you day and night and night and day and day and (laughs) night and it's like yeah yeah that's i get that are you in love with that football player 
Not anymore. He only wanted one thing, to slip me his manuscript. He didn't even have the professional courtesy to try and seduce me first. The men who resent my success won't give me the time of day. And the men who respect my success won't give me the time of night. I don't know about other men, but I swear, if I had the chance, I would respect you and resent you night and day and day and night. Peter, you would? You bet. You're on. <laughs> well, I think too, like what you were, you know, what you're saying about like being a 10 year old kid, like singing, singing songs from anything goes to kids. Like, I feel like that is like that is David Hyde Pierce being like, I have no idea how to be catcher block and I'm going to be an absolute catastrophe in his like sex pad apartment. But like, I'm going to I'm going to labor over this dinner and I'm going to put every ounce of myself into every bit of it. Like, I don't want to burn. I'm making a chocolate souffle. Mm -hmm. Can you taste mm -hmm. this sauce? Is it too sweet? Like, and he he is out of order in the natural hierarchy of how all the men in this movie are relating to women and ostensibly getting what they want from him. Mm -hmm. And it is the inauthenticity of his pursuit of trying to be catch is what prevents him from breaking through with Vicky mm -hmm. and seeming like the homosexual he almost certainly is. Yes, yes. Um, we like to call that overcompensating. In high school, <laughs> yeah. this is a, a side story, in high school, for Valentine's Day, we are recording on Valentine's, by the way, um, I made for my friend, um, her name is Asya, I made her Shrimp Fra Diablo, mm -hmm. and I brought a little portable DVD player, and I played Casablanca for us over lunch, and we just, we, yeah, we ate a romantic lunch wow. time together, even though it was extremely clear that we are not, like, sexually or romantically attracted to one another. Well, and I, I, I think I was so, like, having not rewatched this in, in such a long time, like, I love that scene at the sushi restaurant between Vicky and Peter where she's like, you're a homosexual who's mad, who's clearly madly in love with Catcher, but that's no reason we can't be married. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this movie is okay with Peter being Peter. Even, like, Catcher doesn't really care about anybody but himself. So mm -hmm. he's certainly not, like, really... He, and he likes having someone who idolizes him. I would I would argue that more than being straight, Catch is attention sexual. I think if anybody yeah. in the right bar at the right time gave Catcher Block the amount of attention he wanted, he would be willing to hop in the sack with them. Oh, absolutely. And he likes having somebody. He likes having somebody around him like Peter, who just clearly idolizes him and resents him and wants to be him. Mm -hmm. um, so it's. I think this movie does a lot of interesting things with, as you sort of alluded to before, like actually kind of queering its central relationships where, like, there's a very gay thing that's coming off of, like, ballbuster editor Vicky. But then she's, like, talking about, maybe I just want to be a wife. But then she's saying she'll she'll agree to marry Peter because at least I'll have one man to boss around. And then, mm -hmm. well, they, he can be gay. That won't stop them from being married to each other. And the uh -huh. way he relates to Catcher, like, this is a very subtextually gay movie. Mm -hmm. And the best person to boss around is a gay person. <laughs> Say and, more on that. And, well, I have you been to a gay bar recently? Um, <laughs> I, and the the meta text of, of, of um, Sarah Paulson also being queer, uh, the relationship that she and Barbara uh -huh. have is also a mirror of Catcher and Peter's relationship. But I think Barbara... Yes. The attention that she seeks is not necessarily as um, unhealthy as the attention that yeah. Catcher seeks because the attention that Barbara wants is ultimately from Catcher and is wrapped up in all these really complicated politics mm -hmm. of, of consumption and of sex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think mm -hmm. what's interesting is that Vicky does does have like a very specific goal in mind in terms of the success and how it is supposed to then reflect on her and how that mm -hmm. reflection is then going to impact her own romantic and sexual life. We're going to take a quick break and then I'll talk more with Kyle about Down With Love and his new book. Then I will have one quick thing before I go. That's just a little check-in with uh, friends of the show who've come on because there's little fun updates to relay. Stick around and we'll have a nice little pod in review.
If you have trouble falling asleep, try sleeping with celebrities. Tell me about your view of, of succulents. I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan. It's a different kind of sleep podcast. There are some real benefits to parking illegally. Featuring remarkable guests and unremarkable topics. There's two Orlando airports. From the creator of Depression Mode with John Moe, it's Sleeping with Celebrities. Every week on Maximum Fun. Nighty night, sleepyheads. Hi, I'm Jesse Thorne, the founder of Maximum Fun, and I have a special announcement. I'm no longer embarrassed by my brother, my brother, and me. You know, for years, each new episode of this supposed advice show was a fresh insult, a depraved jumble of erection jokes, ghost humor, and frankly, this is for the best, very little actionable advice. But now, as they enter their twilight years, I'm as surprised as anyone to admit that it's gotten kind of good. Justin, Travis, and Griffin's witticisms are more refined, like a humor column in a fancy magazine. And they hardly ever say Bazinga anymore. So, after you've completely finished listening to every single one of all of our other shows, why not join the McElroy brothers every week for My Brother, My Brother, and Me. Welcome back to Feeling Seen. I'm here with Kyle Turner, whose new book, The Queer Film Guide, comes out this May. We've been looking at 2003's Down With Love, and especially David Hyde Pierce's character, the magazine editor Peter McManus. So let's get back to it. You have written you have written a book now about 100 films that tell LGBTQIA plus stories, and we're talking about the queering of relationships, platonic and platonic sexual, both in in this movie and Down with Love. I wanted to hear from you about sort of like the intake experience of watching that of of like the lived unifying queer experience of that. Do I want you? Do I want to be you? That uh-huh. sort of covetous, consumptiveness kind of relationship. Like, I-, I wanted to hear you just sort of talk about that, perhaps in the context of cinema, and like that as like a part of the queer storytelling tradition, whether it is canonically queer, and we see like two characters pursuing each other in in love or in lust, um, romantically or, or or aromantically, but like with a love story there, mm-hmm. or even just in the sense of that being something that is a vital piece of headcanon for queer people people watching movies where we have been absent for so in so many places. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what's so important about like engaging with film as a way to discuss these ideas of this consumptive, complicated relationship between um, I um, of identity and the uh, catalyzation of desire is that mm-hmm. film teaches us how to desire. Mm. And so it gives us a language to understand, like, um, or to try to clarify, like, that dynamic between um, two people, whether it is, whether it is, um, I want to be you, or I want to sleep with you, or yeah. I want to spend my, li- my life with you. Um, and I think what's so, what was so, um, gratifying about both rewatching this movie um, and also sort of writing about the films that I did for the book is that um, Mm -hmm. as much as it provides us a language to to describe those experiences and feelings, um, it also provides enough space for the ambiguity um, Mm -hmm, and the, mm -hmm. um, the, the gray liminal spaces of, of those, those parts. Um, And I think it allows us then to like also invent and come up with our own ways of conveying those feelings. Does Mm -hmm, that make sense? mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And do you, can you, can you remember like early films where you started clocking that you were learning desire, like where you were sort of experiencing what was happening on screen and being like, I'm connecting to this in a way that feels like I'm mapping something. Mm, Good question. Um, (sighs) It is, and was it a gay thing or was it a straight thing that you were watching? It was a so it was a straight thing. It was actually not a movie. It was a TV show um, called Big Wolf on Campus. <laughs> it was a Canadian awesome. TV show. It's sort of like proto 
Teen Wolf, and there mm, was this. It sound that was in my head. I was like, this sounds like a version of Teen Wolf. Okay. Yeah, it's not good. It's so bad. <laughs> but Loy Beth was the name of like the romantic lead, and she was she supported her werewolf best friend, and um, mm-hmm. so they were sort of romantic interests. Um, and I think it was maybe less that I was attracted. Uh, to her specifically, more the idea that so she was attracted to someone who transformed in some way. Right, werewolf. yeah. Werewolf. Very, very easy, like, queer metaphor there. Oh, yeah. The werewolf, the gayest of the monsters, like, I think. Uh, like, that, that, that transform, that's, that's the gayest. No, vampires are the gayest <laughs> of the monsters. <laughs> I, want, I want everybody to know, Kyle just vehemently shook his head and both of his arms at the same time to tell me no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I object. Like, yes, I, I'm definitely, I, I support the idea that werewolves are very, very queer, very, very gay. But yes. I will always be like, uh, actually, that, um, I take it back. It wasn't Big Wolf on campus. Um, mm. It was probably Dracula. Oh, okay, there we go! There we go, the personal tie-in. It was probably Bram Stoker's Dracula. I was really into vampires as as a kid, um, and I watched um, the Francis Ford Coppola film Bram Stoker's Dracula way too young. I think I was, like, (laughs) nine or ten. Yeah, same. And I I had already been interested in, like, Bela Lugosi, and um, there was something extremely sad, but also so gauche and grotesque about this particular version, um, where the... Uh, you could barely call it su- a subtext in the book, I guess, but it was yeah. very literalized that um, there's sexual violence. And that was like so alienating to me. Um, but also the this um, thrilling and overwhelming sense of yearning that seemed to transcend time. Mm-hmm. I just feel like I tapped into and also the really fabulous dresses. Yeah. Um, oh God, incredible. Ugh, the costume design, just incredible. Um, and I remember... I had many books on vampires as a young person, like 10, 11. And I had this Uh huge behemoth of a book called The Vampire Encyclopedia. And they had specific (laughs) entries on gay vampires and lesbian vampires and LGBTQIA plus vampires and sexuality and vampires. And I would Mm -hmm. always go back to those entries and reread them over and over and over again. And I um, Uh I would spend more time on those specific encyclopedia entries than I would the rest of the book and there was not yeah. there was not at all a moment in which I was self-aware enough to be like huh I wonder why I keep reading <laughs> these passages <laughs> may I ask when you feel like you started achieving queer self-awareness when did I start achieving queer self-awareness that's a good question I think I started achieving uh well I mean the time at which I like came out to myself is um, I was 19 and I was home for the weekend from college and I was making my usual route, which was I would go to the library to get some movies uh-huh. and then I would go to McDonald's to get lunch and then I would go to um, the grocery store to get a pint of ice cream and then I would walk home and then I, that would be my weekend. And I wa- was walking back mm-hmm. and I passed this tree and I looked at the tree and I was like, I guess I like guys. It's been long enough. I've been spent... <laughs> I'd wow! spent- I had spent enough time sort of, like, uh, covertly watching, um, like, solo jerk-off videos and other, like, bisexuals leaning to, like, gay yeah. porn. And by by evening and then by day, writing 4,000-word love letters to girls in high school. Um, so it was just a moment <laughs> of, like, I need to stop convincing myself that this is not a part of me because it's getting kind of embarrassing. And what was so annoying was right. that, like, um, I a lot of it, the reason why it just took so long to come out was because um, I, a lot of people read me as queer when I was growing up, and I just did not want to give them the satisfaction sure. of being right. It was just, like, not fair. <laughs> like, let Which me is come nothing- to it. Nothing is like nothing's more queer than that kind of pettiness too. Yeah, like yeah. just being like, absolutely not, you bitch. Like I yeah. will give you the satisfaction. <laughs> Me gay couldn't be. <laughs> I- well, I think that's. I think that some of the most like I, I had like one of the very fun things about watching Down with Love, and I, I feel like one of the most 
joyful things about being a queer person consuming media is because especially like not being a Gen Zer where I didn't grow up with a with a lot of options for mm. queer representation on screen as an, as somebody who identifies on the A spectrum like I still don't have hardly any of those things so there's a lot of headcanoning still to be done is that we become it's one of the things that excites me most about having queer folks on this podcast is I'm talking, anytime I'm talking to a queer person, I'm talking in a way to somebody who had to become a creative genius, finding themselves mm -hmm. places where they didn't exist. And watching a movie like Down With Love provides so many little outlets to like, we'll look at these two characters, it, it, particularly in Sarah Paulson and in David Hyde Pierce, and just be like, oh, that's queer, that's queer, like long yeah. con, that's, that's canonically queer, vengeance, canonically mm -hmm. queer, petty, spite, like ball busting career, woman being like a finicky man with an art collection like all these ways in which like I can create a constellation of gayness and overlay it in this movie and it doesn't have to be what Peyton Reed meant but it can just be what it means to me and that makes me enjoy it even more quick taste my sauce too tart this is your big emergency yes I invited Vicky to dinner it has to be perfect so she'll find me irresistible and I can make my big move you could have made your big move three weeks ago Mac I keep telling you that's these Down With Love girls claim to fame. One date, no waiting. Yes, well, these Down With Love girls may be used to having sex the way a man does, but I'm not. Too sweet? So this is how a guy like you does it, huh? No, I don't do it. But if I did do it, I'd do what I'm doing. Which reminds me of something I didn't do. And then you you have like these contrasts of versions of masculinity and femininity within the film, and you have uh, David Hyde Pierce's apartment is mm -hmm. so cozy and domestic, and it is w what mm -hmm. that uh, what Catra ends up ends up using because it's a softer version of masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, so I I always appreciated that, and then also Judy Garland is sort of in the movie, so <laughs> sold. <laughs> Yeah, like, Peyton Reed really, I feel like Peyton Reed really did something with this movie. Oh, this is a, such an incredible, I, I, what I, one of the things that I love about this movie so much is that it is, I don't, uh, maybe I'm too pessimistic or cynical, but I, I, I don't want to be like, you couldn't make this today. Um, but I, I think it does tap into, like, a certain sensibility that is um, fairly rare in that it is very explicitly an homage, but it is so, and it's it's also, like, uh, so invested in its pastiche that it doesn't condescend to the source material that it is um, using as as its like uh, framework. Like yeah. it's not making fun of Rock Hudson and Doris Day movies, and I think no. it is unearthing like um, both the 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 whimsy of those films, but also revealing like the really fascinating social and political context of those movies yeah um and exploring them through these characters and through the artifice of it all and i'm realizing with like with peyton reed right we we record this as peyton reed's next movie ant-man and the wasp quantumania is about to <sighs> come out and like it's so like i'm looking at this movie now uh, like down with love now as a like, handshake with bring it on where you have in Peyton somebody who's making these movies that don't like I, I like what you're saying about it it doesn't condescend to these sort of source materials that it is drawing making an homage to and it also doesn't condescend to the like girls and gays that these movies I think ate particularly age for especially well mm -hmm. and I think did court even if they didn't know it in the immediacy like I watch Bring It On Now and that is not a movie that's like I, I don't think it's like gay baiting but like the idea of like baiting an audience because you think they're a cash reservoir for you to mm -hmm. target for your own financial gain I think there is a in both of these movies there's a very sincere appreciation of this kind of content from the person who is directing these films that I think just sincerely lands well with my demographic, with my core demographics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting that this man built his career on movies doing that. Yeah, yeah. His career trajectory has been kind of fascinating. The breakup is also pretty good. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think you need to have at least a baseline respect for that kind of audience or that yes. kind of viewer, because Rock Hudson <clears throat> was gay. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Part of the subtext of 
those sex comedies is mm-hmm. a sort of like irreconcilable difference between yeah. um those those characters and those actors mm-hmm. um but is also able to those char- those actors are still able to use their reservoir of charm and magnetism to still create something to still create like a really beautiful fantasy yeah no i i, I think you're i think you're exactly right and i i guess as we get toward the end of the conversation, I want to bring your book back into it, which it, it, in the aspect of how, when you were curating what you wanted your 100 to be, what was your sort of, what was your ethos approach to like queer, like it, like watching the um, the documentary uh, Horror Noir, they make the distinction in the movie between horror with black folks and black horror. And I mm. wanted to hear from you, like when you're curating these films, how did you delineate between or decide what would be your priority in films that were queer stories versus stories with queer people in them? And like, because it can be so murky with Hayes Code and the passage mm-hmm. of time and things being veiled versus being explicit. Like, how did you winnow in on what was going to be your sort of core determining factors for what made these LGBTQIA plus stories? Authorship, mm. on screen representation? What was mm. that? That's such a good question. Um, I think um, my guiding ethos was. Um, God, this makes me sound so petty, but if I'm being honest, it was. <laughs> I am frequently um, frustrated. I've used the word frustrated Mm -hmm. a lot because I'm actually a curmudgeon. I'm uh, 70 years old. Um, (laughs) uh, Wrestling with the conversations uh, with regards to um, representation, there Mm -hmm. tends to be this um, impulse to present representation in marginalized communities as this linear thing. Yeah. um, That there is... That, that there's this kind of representation and then the next step of it and then the third step, which is how we get Love, Simon, which is not the case, which is not yes. how um, art or culture works. And so what was really important for me mm-hmm. was to engage with the different facets of how um, LGBTQI plus and, and queer um, authorship or queer sensibility could be imbued or inflected explicitly and implicitly within mm-hmm. these works. I did want to start, especially um, earlier... Uh, in the book, because um, it goes chronologically, I did want to start with like Good. fairly explicit representations of of um, queer identity and and queer romance, just to give uh, a sense to the reader that these um, artifacts have existed for a- almost a century. I, I think um, by trying to um, mold a-, a linearity to understanding um, how identities and um, desires actually function in and are sublimated or imbued into like culture and art Mm -hmm. um i think we do ourselves a disservice to understanding how we got where we are because i think Mm -hmm. what was very important to me in terms of picking the um uh, the movies that are in the book Mm -hmm. is to give a wide range of how queerness can be engaged with and interpreted because it's not Mm -hmm. I, i would say that like Almost all the films have like explicitly LGBTQIA plus characters, mm-hmm. but more than that, uh, m- many of the movies engage with queerness in a, in a different way from like a political um, context or or frame of reference, like Born in Flames, the Lizzie Borden um, yes. film. Um, they engage with queerness as a like a f- an aesthetic form or sensibility, like Funeral Parade of Roses from 1969, mm-hmm. which I think is an incredibly radical film. And then um, you have queerness as more of an implicit way of of projecting one's identity onto another and using that as a way to understand oneself, like Persona, the Ingmar Bergman film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have uh, the suppression of queerness itself through art, like Professor Marston and the Wonder Women, mm-hmm, uh, which mm-hmm. came out a few years ago. Uh, so I think there's, uh, and and I also wanted to, um, to bring in films that were like fairly controversial for their time mm-hmm. to talk about um, or to engage with the idea that um, that there are films about queerness that are, I think, significant, but were not necessarily um, that that came out at a 
bad time, so to speak. That right. They, and because partially because of respectability politics, partially because of mm-hmm. the author, the supposed authorship of the film, Cruising has become one of my favorite movies recently because I think it's such a fascinating document of the 1980s of the um, leather S and M scene in New York in the um, late yeah. 70s, 80s, um, and I think it's especially a useful document to understand the relationship between queerness and white supremacy. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So I want to, um, I want to provide uh, a, a resource that could give people different entryways through um, genre and approach and style and even stardom or director and whatnot. I That was exactly the expansive kind of conversation <gasps> I hoped to get into with you about the movies that make up your new book and the entry point of David Hyde Pierce in a Peyton Reed movie <gasps> that is uh, allegedly heterosexual from 2003. That was the perfect gateway for me <laughs> to get into this. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kyle. I really loved having this conversation with thank you. Thank you so much. I had such a blast. It was really such an honor. Thank you again so much for having me. Is your book in pre-order now? It is in pre-order. It comes out, okay. I believe, May 16th, um, right before okay. Pride. So if you have any uh, any friends that you want to, uh, that are curious about <laughs> queer cinema, like I'm I'm excited for this book, not only because I'm proud of the writing, but I'm excited because um, yeah. I, I know that there are people who desperately want to understand like the history of queer representation in film. Mm-hmm. That they, that for whatever reason, um, they have not found the things that they're looking for. And I mm-hmm. and I want to be able to share that history with them. I think that there's such an expansive, cool, interesting, um, exciting, and galvanizing history of mm-hmm. queer cinema um, that... Um, that deserves more attention. And I, and I hope that anyone who's curious at a beginner level or more, yeah. uh, or who already loves Paul Morrissey and my <laughs> hustler or whatever, I hope that there's something for them in this book. I am glad that it is, it, it's, it's in an isolation, a dedicated text so that somebody who finds themselves reading through the gay vampire section of their vampire encyclopedia doesn't have to just flip to a specialty part of a bigger book. They have a whole book for themselves. Exactly, exactly. And there are <laughs> definitely some gay vampires in the book, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Kyle. Thank you so much for having me on, Jordan. This was so much fun. Thank you very much, Kyle Turner. Pre-order that book if you are interested in it. Pre-orders help out a lot. They really, really do. You know, when you see people out there on Twitter being like, hey, smash that pre-order button. My book's coming out. Like, it makes a big difference. Um, for the authors. So seriously, if you're interested in this at all for yourself or perhaps a gift, it comes out in May. Guess what? Pride is June. So buy gifts for the gays in your life. And to keep up with Kyle's bylines, follow him on social media. We have got a link in the show notes. We never really say the like, and look at the show notes for XYZ. So we've, we finally crossed the look at the show notes threshold of this podcast. Feels like we're a real pod now. Um, And as promised, the one quick thing before I go, we just, there are just fun updates to share about people, uh, treasured guests who have been on this in the past. I think first and foremost, uh, Ki Hui Kwan has won yet another award. He recently took home the Screen Actors Guild Trophy for Best Supporting Actor. Check him off. The guy has kind of got all the hardware that tells you he's going to win an Oscar. But we can't count the chickens. We cannot. But we are rooting for Ki Hui Kwan to win the Best Supporting Actor Oscar. He's one step closer now. Uh, Previous treasured guest, Ariel Vida, her second film, her second feature film, Trim Season, it was just announced. It's going to be playing at the Overlook Film Festival coming up. And we are so excited for her second effort to be reaching the world. And speaking of the Overlook Film Festival, Francesca Maldonado, recent guest, uh, her anthology film, her anthology film, my anthology film, the one we both worked on, that is also playing at Overlook Film Festival. So look at that, me right there alongside my friend Ariel Vida. I could not be more thrilled and proud. Uh, And then other fun updates from other guests. Uh, Josh Johnson. You guys remember Josh Johnson? He talked about Heath Ledger's Joker in the, the dark night and relating to him. Well, 
He's got another stand-up special out, Up Here Killing Myself. It is on Peacock. And then yet another prior treasured guest, Christopher Landon, director Christopher Landon. His film, uh, We Have a Ghost, is now live on Netflix. So look at that. You've got so much you can catch up on for feeling seen alums, friends of the program. How exciting. What a fun thing to be able to do. Like, look at that. We, we, we have little runners now. We have people we care about. We, we have plots we're following. Kiwi Kwan, we love you. Um, and that's it. That's our show. You can follow us on Twitter at FeelingScenePod, or you can send us an email at FeelingScene at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Jor Crew on Twitter. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher, and this is a production of Maximum Fun. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.